Hello and welcome to this video about the poem War Photographer by Carol Ann Duffy. Hopefully in this video I'm going to help you understand some key ideas about the poem. So if you look at the learning objectives on the screen to read and understand the key ideas in the poem, so that's AO1, Assessment Objective 1, to explore and analyse the effect of language, form and structure, that's Assessment Objective 2, and to appreciate how the poem's context helps us understand the poem's key themes, so that's Assessment Objective 3. So by looking at the poem through those three different directions then you should be fully equipped to be able to write about the poem and appreciate how you could compare it to other poems in your anthology and on that note can you please make sure before you continue with the video you do need a copy of the poem in front of you pen pencil highlighter something so that you're going to be able to pause and make notes as we go through what you can see now is one of the most famous war photographs ever taken. It was taken by a photographer called Nick Ut, and it was taken in 1972 at the time of the Vietnam War, which if you're interested in, you could read a little bit more about. What I want you to think about is the story behind this photograph. So the South Vietnamese Air Force accidentally, so mistakenly, dropped napalm, so chemical warfare, dropped napalm on a village. And what you can see in this photograph are children who've been burned by those chemicals running away from the explosion. How does that photograph make you feel? Is it important that this photograph exists? So some big questions I've asked you to think about there. This is the same photograph, but this time you can see the arrows pointing to somebody on the right hand side. And if you look closely, you should be able to see that this is a photographer who, as these children are running past him screaming, he is doing something with his camera, presumably altering a setting ready to take another photograph. Now, when this was spotted in this famous photograph, there was a, some controversy about what that means for humanity. If this person is so focused on their job, on getting a good photograph of situations like this, is it ethical that he's able to do that while screaming children are running past him? And you know, the naked girl in the picture has ripped her clothes off where she's burning from the chemical. These are children who are in distress and her life was actually later at risk because of this. How does that make you feel? Does that change the way that you look at this photograph? Now you can see most of the photograph again now, but on the right hand side you can now see the photographer Nick Ut. And the story I want to tell you about his role in this photograph is he took this photograph, but what actually happened after he took the photograph is realising just how much pain that girl was in, he said, this is a quotation from him, I took a lot of water and poured it on her body. She was screaming, too hot, too hot. So he took her to hospital where he was told that she might not survive. 30% of her body was covered in third degree burns. So he then took her to a different hospital, to an American facility where American soldiers could be treated. And he managed to arrange for her life to be saved after this photograph was taken. How does that make you feel? Does that change the way that you see this photograph? And another thing to think about, a lot of people say that this photograph actually changed the direction of the Vietnam War because when this was published and people saw this photograph around the world, it actually changed the way that people perceived that war and whether they supported it or not and pressure changed and things started to move. And some people have even suggested that this photograph played a role in the end of that conflict. The title of the poem that we're looking at, War Photographer, obviously links to what we've just been talking about. And this idea of the ethical dilemma that's faced by a photographer is something that Carol Ann Duffy talks about in the poem. A war photographer is doing their job. Their job is to take photographs of conflict. And so they are ending up taking photographs of people who are in distress, in danger, and a lot of war photographs are incredibly distressing to look at. When you think about doing that job, it's a very strange job indeed. You're not there to save or rescue people, you are literally there to capture moments of great distress. And this kind of ethical dilemma about is that the right thing to be doing, it's, is it important that we have these photographs? What impact does that actually have on all of us? 
is one of the things that Carolyn Duffy explores through the poem. So before we even look at the poem, that's an idea that's really important that you have in your mind. And to help you with that, I'm going to follow this now with a little video that you're going to hear various war photographers talking about their work and hopefully that will help bring this idea of what a complicated moral position these photographers in and actually a lot of them asked to be called anti-war photographers because very few of them having seen the things that they've seen enjoy the title of suggesting that they've taken any glory from taking photographs of these moments of distress. Documentary photography and war photography, particularly war photography, people get very excited about it and think it's great fun, it's, it's very sexy, but it's not. It's not sexy because it's filled with, with putrid smells and, and horrible noises and, and desperate thoughts. And if you empath, empathise with the people in front of you, you can just imagine how absolutely terrified they become when faced with an aggressive force. And then you realise you're part of that force. Nothing you will ever, ever do will placate that. And nothing you ever do will get the images out of your head of these people and what happened to these people. I had such a lot of conflict, personal conflict, from working as an army photographer and trying to establish something of a story without being sucked into making very PR-heavy images. I can conjure up the most appalling thoughts. It doesn't have to be at night time. I can I can have those thoughts sitting in a taxi or on a train going through the English countryside. You know, I have so many appalling memories. You're not going to do it. You're not going to have a life like 50 years of what I've done. It's not going to be a kind of convenience that, you know, you can have a nice day and push all these things away. They come totally uninvited, unexpected, and, you know, that's, you, get, you get by. What good have I done showing these pictures of suffering? And you know, when a person's dying or he's injured badly, he's in shock and that, does he need you looking over him with a camera? You're the last person he wants to see. He wants to see, you know, medical people rushing towards him, not me. If everyone could be there to see for themselves the fear and the grief just one time, then they would understand that nothing is worth letting things get to the point where that happens to even one person, let alone thousands. But everyone cannot be there, and that is why photographers go there, to show them, to reach out and grab them and make them stop what they're doing and pay attention to what is going on, to create pictures powerful enough to overcome the diluting effects of the mass media and shake people out of their indifference, to protest, and by the strength of that protest, to make others protest. You know, a lot of people ask me, why do you do this? It's so dangerous and you risk your life for what? It's the sense of responsibility that I have, especially now when journalists are targeted on purpose. That anger drives me. I have this privilege to see humanity at its best and its worst and everything in between. But I don't think that doing this is ever worth your life. Okay, so let's start looking at the context of this poem and thinking about the poet and what we can find out about her, which might help us to understand the poem a little bit more. So Carol Ann Duffy, you can see, 
at the bottom of the screen there. She is an incredibly famous poet. She was the first female poet laureate. She doesn't shy away from writing poetry about difficult subjects and this is a great example of one of those poems. She wrote the poem in 1985. So this was a time before digital cameras were around. So some of the references in the poem might seem a little bit unusual to you watching this in a digital age where we're used to people being able to immediately see their photograph on the screen. In the top left hand corner, you can see um, what would have been put in a camera in 1985, what war photographers would have been using. So there's a spool of negatives, that film canister goes inside the camera and you'd have to wait to get that developed. And it would usually be developed in a dark room, so a room with no light that would ruin the negative and where chemicals are used to then turn that negative into a photograph. And that would have been the experience of two photographers with whom Carol Ann Duffy was very good friends. Don McCullen, who's on the right hand side, and Philip Jones Griffiths, who's on the left hand side. So as a friend of these war photographers, Carol Ann Duffy would hear their stories and see their very mixed emotions when they returned home from being on location. And this is what inspired her to write the poem. So we can talk about this being a poem that's based on her experience of listening to her friends and reflecting on some of the things that they had said. Now in the actual poem, three conflicts are mentioned by name. We don't actually have a definite conflict the poem is about and that doesn't matter. At the time that Caroline Duffy was writing the poem, you know, there was conflict around the world, for example, the Iraq-Iran war and those are the kinds of conflicts that would have been influencing her. She talks about Belfast, so Belfast being the capital of Northern Ireland and the centre of three decades of troubles. So you've possibly heard of the troubles in Northern Ireland. Um, you've probably heard of the IRA, for example. Again, any of these historical events, you don't need to know the detail, but if you don't know anything about them, it might be something you want to do a bit of extra reading about. But when she refers to Belfast in the poem, she's talking about a place where there was a lot of violence. She also talks about Beirut, the capital of Lebanon in the Middle East, the setting for a civil war in the 1970s, and then the destructive Lebanon war that followed in the 1980s. So again, Beirut, a capital city that um, a lot of it destroyed and a lot of people there who would have lived in conflict for a long time. And then finally, she talks about Phnom Penh, um, the capital of Cambodia in Southeast Asia. Now this was a site of the atrocities of the Khmer Rouge genocide in the late 1970s. So again, you might have heard of this, you might not have done the name Pol Pot as a dictator, might mean something to you, but really awful human atrocities, murders of you know, a great many people in that genocide, quite distressing to read about but if you've never heard of it before that's something you could go away and research but all of these conflicts would have been relevant to Caroline Duffy growing up and her friendship with these photographers so it might just be worth having a little bit of a reference to that in the poem because those three places will come up and you need to see how they fit into the idea of the poem. Okay so we're ready now to have a look at the poem and read through it. So what I always say about reading poems is you can never let a poem sink in by reading it once. You need to read it several times and each time you read it, wait, let the meaning kind of wash into you, then read it again and you'll find that on each reading something else will start to settle and you'll understand it more and more. So I'm going to read it once. My advice would be to pause the video after that point and then do that rereading and rereading until you feel happy that the poem has settled into your mind and then we'll start to go through it and do the analysis. War Photographer by Carol Ann Duffy. In his dark room, he is finally alone, with spools of suffering set out in ordered rows. The only light is red and softly glows as though this were a church and he a priest preparing to intone a mass. Belfast, Beirut, Phnom Penh, all flesh is grass. He has a job to do. Solutions slop in trays beneath his hands, which did not tremble then, though seem to now. Rural England, home again to ordinary pain, which simple weather can dispel. 
to fields which don't explode beneath the feet of running children in a nightmare heat. Something is happening. A stranger's features faintly start to twist before his eyes, a half-formed ghost. He remembers the cries of this man's wife, how he sought approval without words to do what someone must, and how the blood stained into foreign dust. A hundred agonies in black and white, from which his editor will pick out five or six for Sunday's supplement. The reader's eyeballs prick with tears between the bath and pre-lunch beers. From the aeroplane, he stares impassively at where he earns his living, and they do not care. So the title, War Photographer, matter of fact, which actually is going to reflect the style of the entire poem. So there's nothing cryptic in the title. We have the title of this person's job, and that is part of what the poem then explores, what it would be like to be in that situation. So the title very clearly frames that this is going to be a third person sort of looking in on the role of a war photographer. It's told by an omniscient narrator. So that means a narrator who's able to look down on this war photographer but know exactly what that character is thinking and feeling, so an omniscient narrator. And that helps us to understand the dilemma, the turmoil that this war photographer is experiencing. So we've got a clinical matter-of-fact style and that reflects the distance that the war photographer has to have when he goes out on location and has to have a distance between the horror of what he's seeing and the fact that he's, his job is to take photographs of it. So very clever the way that the narrative voice has been set up by Caroline Duffy. Let's also just quickly talk about the structure of the poem before we start digging into it. We've got four equal stanzas, we've got a regular rhyme scheme and all of this creates a sense of things being organised and if we think about the meaning of the poem this could perhaps reflect the ordered rows of photographs that this war photographer is developing out of all the spools of film that he's got lined up and then he develops them and then he'd hang them up to dry and that idea of being ordered and organised is then really interestingly in total contrast to what the photographs are actually of. The photographs are of chaos and pain and there's nothing organised or sensible or calm about it. So those disturbing images told through this really matter-of-fact organised poem all help with this conflict between the job of the war photographer and the horror of what's actually being photographed. So really interesting and if you can understand those ideas that's always a really good thing to be able to do to talk about how structure and style and narrative voice helps us understand the meaning and the themes of the poem. So I should have said, if you've not watched one of my videos before, the little um, box that says literary terms, it looks like a little book. I always just put some key techniques that you might want to use when you're talking about the poem. It is not a test to see how many clever words you can remember. It's much more important that you understand the poem, what it's about, the way it's written. But these techniques can help you to talk about those. So I've got the definitions there if you pause the screen to help you if I've said something that you're not sure what that means. Okay, let's look at stanza one then. In his dark room, he is finally alone with spools of suffering set out in ordered rows. So I've mentioned the dark room before, so pre-digital age, this is where a photographer would need to go to develop their photographs. And on the right hand side is actually a picture of a photographer in a dark room. So the dark room could be perhaps a metaphor for his mind, for his soul, for his heart, because certainly what we find out through this poem is that underneath the duty of doing his job he has to have some pretty dark feelings and emotions but he's in real life in this dark room and he's developing these photos he is finally alone so we have that emphasis on the word finally if we think about what that might mean it suggests that he's finally got time to think that until this point he's not even had a moment to stop and think and reflect on what he's experienced. So the dark room becomes like an intimate setting, almost like a sanctuary where he can feel safe and he can start to think and be alone. In his dark room, 
he is finally alone with spools of suffering set out in ordered rows. Now, that word with at the start of the second line is really interesting because at the beginning we were told he's finally alone and then suddenly that conjunction with suggests that actually he's not alone, he's actually got something else with him. It's not another person, he's with spools of suffering set out in ordered rows. And that totally transforms that initial idea that actually he was safe on his own. That's almost been snatched away because what he's on his own and left with is this metaphorical spools of suffering. It's really emotive, that metaphor. We've got alliteration to bring our attention, the sound of that metaphor as well. Spools of suffering set out. So that sibilance there with the sound, spools of suffering set out in ordered rows. And suddenly all of these undeveloped film canisters become a symbol of the suffering that's going to be inside each one. Each negative is going to tell a story of suffering in a place in conflict. And if you think then about them all being set out in ordered rows, it's hard not to think about the image of graves, headstones, a cemetery, and all of these images of death and suffering are already starting to spoil that idea at the beginning that he's somewhere that's actually safe and quiet and peaceful. The only light is red and softly glows as though this were a church and he a priest preparing to intone a mass. Now a red light would be used in a dark room but what Caroline Duffy does with that fact is she actually makes the light become symbolic and the fact that it's red gives us the connotation of bloody danger. It also is then linked to this idea of a church. So in a Catholic church and she talks about a mass later, a candle would always be lit, the light shining all the time. So it brings now this religious symbolism into the poem. And what happens is the photographer becomes like a priest. So that's similarly as though this were a church and he a priest preparing to intone a mass. So why compare the photographer to a priest? Well, if you think about a priest, they're often exposed to human suffering, they're exposed to death, and so is the photographer. So we've got one link there. We've also got a priest who might be preparing for a funeral. There's that sort of sombre association with what the job of that priest might be. But also, a religion is something hugely serious and takes an awful lot of commitment from somebody just like the photographer is taking his role very seriously and is committed to what they've believed in in taking that job and they believe the importance of what they're doing but it's like his camera has become something more than just a camera on the one hand we've got it linked to atrocities captured on film his art his photography becomes like trauma and then we've also got his art linked to religion. So everything is being raised in status to make his job seem like it's something that's really profoundly important. And then we go from this religious imagery to these three places that I've already talked about. So places that are synonymous with conflict, with pain, with suffering, with death. Belfast, Beirut, Phnom Penh. And each word you'll notice there's that caesura. So we've got Belfast, full stop. Beirut, full stop, Phnom Penh, full stop. And those full stops, that's a zero, what it does is it fixes each place and gives it space in the poem. She doesn't need to say anything about it. Those places are infamous enough, especially in the time that she published this poem, people would immediately associate the name of those three places with suffering. And those full stops allow that space to develop around it for those memories to sink in to the reader. At the very end of that line, we then get what's actually a quotation from the Old Testament in the Bible. All flesh is grass. So really subtly, she uses this quote from the Bible. What it refers to is the fragility of life. It's a quote that's part of obviously a bigger idea about everybody dying eventually and everybody's bodies returning to earth. So this last line of the poem is linking the religious symbolism of this war photographer's job with death, with this idea that everyone, and linked to those places of conflict, you know, death becomes this really overwhelming concept. So in the second stanza, 
we're still in the dark room. He has a job to do. And here we've got Cezura again, where we reach that sort of simple sentence, he has a job to do. It's such a straightforward statement, but it does more than that. He has a job to do is how he sees his job. When he's there, he feels like it's something he has to do. He has to be distanced. He has to get on with it. No matter how traumatic the things that he sees, he has to just get those photographs. Solutions slop in trays beneath his hands. That word solution, some people have suggested there's a double meaning there. The solutions is actually talking about the chemical solutions that you need to be able to develop the photographs. Could it also be about the solutions to conflict, being that if people take photographs, if war photographers are sharing those photographs with the rest of the world, then maybe people will act, maybe people will try and resolve that conflict. So solutions slop in trays beneath his hands, which did not tremble then though seem to now. So we've now learn a little bit more about this war photographer. In the moment of being in these places of great conflict, his hands are absolutely still and steady taking the photograph. But now, later, when he's in the quiet of his dark room, his hands are trembling. And trembling hands, a symptom of PTSD, so post-traumatic stress disorder, the idea that actually the trauma of what he's witnessed he might have, in the moment, have been very stoic and thought, this is my job, I've just got to get on with it. But actually, now we see that he has been traumatised enough that even his hands are trembling with the fear and trauma and suffering of those memories. Rural England. Now, again, we've got that sentence on its own with the caesura. We've got rural England as being the setting where his darkroom is. And if we think about Belfast, Beirut, Phnom Penh, there's an obvious contrast now, the antithesis between rural England, not even a city in England, the English countryside where it seems like a total symbol of safety compared to those cities that we've been introduced to where we imagine gunfire and destruction. Home again, to ordinary pain which simple weather can dispel. So what Caroline Duffy is doing here is she's setting up this juxtaposition between the safety and peacefulness of where he lives when he comes home to the countryside in England where most things can be solved if the weather changes to the places where the war photographer's been and the suffering that he has witnessed. And this creates a lot of unease. We've got this kind of home versus war conflict here. He's paid to record human suffering. It's his job, it's how he earns his money. He has to distance himself from the violence. And then when he comes home, he lives this life that is so different to how he's earned his money. Then this final image, now we've talked about the famous photograph in Vietnam, you'll see the clever link that Caroline Duffy's made here. So home again to ordinary pain, which simple weather can dispel, to fields which don't explode beneath the feet of running children in a nightmare heat. It's impossible not to think that it was exactly this photograph that has inspired that image in that final line, that you know, he comes home and he's somewhere where children can run across the fields and it's an image of safety and happiness and innocence, yet he's been in a place where that same image of children running has got some really terrifying, sinister references. Okay, so at the start of stanza three, we reach the volta of the poem. So the volta is the turning point, a moment of dramatic shift in the tone or the theme of the poem. And we have another caesura here, so something is happening, full stop. We've gone from this quiet, ordered, organised, sorting things out in the dark room to this sudden suggestion that something's about to change, something is happening. A stranger's features faintly start to twist before his eyes. So we've got more alliteration here with the features and the faintly. And it's all setting up an eerie atmosphere now. The features faintly, so even through the sound in the poem, start to twist, that verb twist, suggesting that something's not right, something's going wrong, is going out of shape, start to twist before his eyes. And now we reach the final image in this sentence that brings this eerie image to life, a half-formed ghost.
Now what's actually happening is as the photo is developing in the darkroom, initially it doesn't go from blank to the perfect photograph. What would happen is as the chemicals did their work, the photo would slowly start to reveal itself. So the half formed ghost is half formed because the photograph hasn't quite developed yet. So you're starting to see the sort of outline of a shape, but not all of the details of it. But it's really clever because it works in two ways. What the photo is going to reveal eventually is a dying man. And the idea of describing him as a half formed ghost also suggests that he is on his way to death and therefore becoming a half formed ghost, if you like. So really clever imagery here. He remembers the cries of this man's wife, how he sought approval without words to do what someone must and how the blood stained into foreign dust. So as this photograph develops, memory flashback takes over. And as the photo develops, what he starts to remember is a sound. Now, multi-sensory imagery is powerful in this poem. Most of the images are about sight, but in this stanza, sound really takes over. So he remembers the sound through the photograph. And what the sound he's remembering is the sound of the man who's dying, his wife, who is crying with her grief. In that moment, the photographer can't change what's happened to the man, but what he can do is take a photograph to record this moment and then share it with others. It links to this idea that he has a job to do, that this is his duty, this is what he needs to do. So he sought approval without words. So notice again the sound. We've got the crying of the woman and it's juxtaposed with the silence of the fact that he didn't even speak to her. He sought approval without words to do what someone must. That word must, really important for the theme of the poem. He feels like his job is that he has to take that photo. His duty is that he has to distance himself from the crying, distance himself from the emotion of the moment and just get that photograph, focus on that one image how the blood stained into foreign dust and obviously that image of blood staining into dust really brings the violence and the loss of life home to us. So we could also go back to the idea of him being like a priest here, you know, like a priest might be with someone in their final intimate moments of life. The photographer is with this man and his wife as that man dies and everything about his job becomes really emotional and intimate yet at the same time is so distanced and cold. And interesting that the only photograph that's described as being developed in this poem is just this one couple. And that's clever too, because the personal cost of war is being described in this stanza. And yet a lot of the poem talks about how we've become desensitised to the personal cost of war because we're so used to seeing these photos that actually maybe people don't really think about this personal moment between husband and wife and the photograph that he takes of that. So the final stanza of the poem is really used to make the kind of main theme about this ethical dilemma really clear. So what we now look at is the bigger picture of why this photographer has been taking these photos and what will happen once they've been developed in the dark room. So we're out of the dark room now and we're out of that kind of intimacy and safety of the dark room and we suddenly see the world in which the war photographer has to exist. A hundred agonies in black and white from which his editor will pick out five or six. Now we've got another emotive metaphor just like we had spools of suffering in stanza one a hundred agonies is describing the photographs that he's developed but to describe them metaphorically as agonies really brings to life that every single photograph is reflective of somebody else's trauma and suffering and pain in conflict a hundred agonies in black and white from which his editor will pick out five or six for Sunday's supplement. So a supplement in a newspaper, often a weekend paper will have a supplement. It's basically a bit like a magazine that's put inside the newspaper. And rather than telling the main news stories, it will go into more detail about things that are sort of behind the main news story. So it's not even the main news that his pictures are going into. And the editor comes across as being 
really careless and indifferent and disingenuous, not really invested in the emotion of the photographs. He flicks through a hundred agonies and he'll just pick five or six. And that enjambement there all helps with this idea that for the editor, it's all just a bit of a casual thing that he does as part of his job. And the fact that it's going in the Sunday supplement, Sunday being the traditional day of rest, all feeds back into that image at the start of, and the religious connotations. The reader's eyeballs prick with tears. Now that verb prick there is interesting because a prick is not a massively deep or serious wound normally it's just a sort of little temporary wound or a temporary feeling so deliberately using that idea that as the reader looks at the couple of photos that have been chosen their eyeballs prick with tears but that's about it it's not really a genuine distress as to what they're seeing between the bath and the pre-lunch beers and then that just brings this home even more that in spite of all the suffering that the war photographer tries to bring home through his photographs, the reality is that people don't really react to them in a way that's got any deep meaning. These people, the readers, are discussed in a way that suggests that they've got compassion fatigue, they're apathetic, they're desensitised. So those words, what they mean is that they're so used to seeing these terrible photos, they don't really seem to care that much. They're not particularly affected by them and in fact they're so desensitized that they can look at the photos between having a bath and having a beer so all these luxuries of living in peace and living in freedom and in between they look at the photo and think oh that's a bit sad it's called bathos it's sort of an anti-climax we've had all this agony and trauma about the development of the photographs and now Carol Ann Duffy uses this bathos to totally disappoint us, if we like. We see, from the photographer's perspective, all that duty and all the terrible things he sees and tries to bring home, believing that at least his job is going to be meaningful. And the reality is that a couple of the photos make it into this supplement and people look at them but carry on their lives as if nothing's happened. So this brings us to those final two lines of the poem where we see the impact of this on that war photographer. From the aeroplane, he stares impassively at where he earns his living and they do not care. Now this last image is almost like a photograph in itself, which is another clever technique that Carol Ann Duffy uses. So you can imagine this photograph of this photographer in the aeroplane, presumably going back to the conflict zone, and he's looking down out of the aeroplane. It's like the cycle's beginning all over again. He's going back to take more photographs of pain and suffering and fear that he'll then bring back and people won't care. And he stares out the window impassively. That word suggests that he doesn't really have any emotion. He's emotionally cold when he looks down at his homeland, the place where he should feel safe. He should perhaps feel worried about leaving that safety, but actually he's left feeling emotionless. The place where he earns his living and they do not care. And using the they at that point, it all helps us see this idea that as a photographer, he feels separated and isolated from the place where he actually should feel that he belongs. He doesn't see himself as being the same with the people that he lives with when he's back home. He separates himself from them. And our concluding image is that he's straddling these two different worlds, the world of conflict, his world of his safety of his home, but he doesn't actually feel like he belongs in either. And it's a really sad conclusion to the poem where we're left with this idea of the irony of the photographer that he feels indifferent to his homeland and they feel indifferent to the photographs that he's taking. So it's quite a miserable conclusion, if we like. And the whole poem has therefore explored this sort of paradox, the idea that at this time of writing, the imagery of war was more prevalent than in any other time in history. People had all this access to see how terrible conflict was, but they'd been exposed to it so much that actually people had almost stopped reacting to it. And that and its impact on being a war photographer is what the poem really does explore. So what you'll need to do 
in a GCSE exam is to compare the poem War Photographer with one of the other poems from your anthology. And this is not an exhausted list that I'm about to give you now because you could find comparisons with most of the poems. But I've just tried to pick some that I think really obviously have some links that would be really nice to look at in a bit more detail. So if you think about the poem London by Blake, in both poems you've got this really frustrated and angry tone. So you've got two characters who are looking at the humans around them and feeling frustrated by the way that they're behaving and their indifference to suffering. Charge of the Light Brigade is an interesting one because in Charge of the Light Brigade Tennyson's actually showing very contrasting views about conflict and the role of the artist in documenting this. As a poet Tennyson believes that he should be celebrating and commemorating all of those involved in the Charge of the Light Brigade, making them heroes. Whereas the idea of the war photographer is a lot more emotionally complicated in terms of what should be happening and how people should be reacting. In Exposure by Owen, both poems explore the impact of conflict as something that's really isolating and also that feeling of bitterness by those who are involved, feeling like they're being misunderstood, not represented fairly. In Bayonet Charge by Hughes, we've got the poets depicting the conflict between a sense of duty and the emotional impact of conflict on the individual. So there's some really interesting comparisons to be made there. Now, an obvious one with Remains by Armitage, you've got the soldier and the war photographer both suffering from PTSD. Both poets, therefore, are looking at the power of memory and how trauma in a conflicted mind and the damage that it can do. The emigre by Rumens could also work as a comparison because in both poems you've got this idea of isolation, of that lack of belonging and but also of belonging, and then the importance of the power of memory. And then the last one I've chosen is Kamikaze by Garland. Here you've got the characters described both being morally conflicted, tormented by their memories, impacted by conflict, but not really being understood by others around them. So you've got the kamikaze pilot whose family don't even understand and then we've got this image of the photographer looking down on his homeland and not being understood. So hopefully that will help you give some ideas as to how you could use this in a comparison. And that nearly brings us to the end of the video. So what I'm hoping is that by listening to that and making some notes and reading the poem a couple of times, you should now feel more confident about being able to read and understand key ideas in the poem exploring language form and structure but also that you've got something that you could think about in terms of the poem's context, why it was written, when it was written and how that helps us understand the main themes. Now I'd normally end the video at this point but I'm actually going to leave a photographer called James Knockway to finish this video. He's an award-winning war photographer and in the clip that we're going to end with he explores exactly some of the dilemma of a war photographer that Caroline Duffy found so interesting in her poem. So I will leave you with his really powerful words. I hope this has helped. Thanks for listening. Bye. In a war, the normal codes of civilized behavior are suspended. It would be unthinkable in so-called normal life to go into someone's home where the family is grieving over the death of a loved one and spend long moments photographing them. It's, it simply wouldn't be done. Those pictures could not have been made unless I was accepted by the people I'm photographing. It's simply impossible to photograph moments such as those without the complicity of the people I'm photographing, without the fact that they welcomed me, that they accepted me, that they wanted me to be there. They understand that a stranger who's come there with a camera to show the rest of the world what is happening to them gives them a voice in the outside world that they otherwise wouldn't have. They realize that they are the victims of some kind of injustice, of some kind of unnecessary violence. And 
by allowing me there to photograph it, they're making their own appeal to the outside world and to everyone's sense of right and wrong. Why photograph war? Is it possible to put an end to a form of human behavior which has existed throughout history by means of photography? The proportions of that notion seem ridiculously out of balance, yet that very idea has motivated me. For me, the strength of photography lies in its ability to evoke a sense of humanity. If war is an attempt to negate humanity, then photography can be perceived as the opposite of war. And if it's used well, it can be a powerful ingredient in the antidote to war. In a way, if an individual assumes the risk of placing himself in the middle of a war in order to communicate to the rest of the world what is happening, he's trying to negotiate for peace.